Can we start, please? We were told that the video needs to be played first, so can we have the video? Otherwise, I'll start talking and then you can't stop me really, so. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's a great pleasure being here. Um, I also thought it's going to be great being in a nice AC room, but under these lights, it's like outside. <laughs> I'm very happy to have an uh, excellent uh, team here with me today to show you and tell you how to invest with success in Morocco. So we have two superstar bankers and two superstar clients with us today. Um, my name is Anna Drashkovic. I'm head of business development, and I'm pleased to introduce um, Antoine Saldeshu, our director, head of Morocco, um, Adil Shiki, director, head of ICA Morocco and Tunisia, and we have our two clients with us, Hassan Belkayak, GM and CEO of Stonebridge A and I, and we have Mustafa Lagari, CEO of Tui Auto and general manager of Tui Auto Gestamp Morocco. Thank you for joining us. So maybe we can start with Antoine, who will give us uh, a brief overview uh, of his uh, activities and views of Morocco, and then we'll um, hang on with the session. And turn over to you. Thanks, Anna, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here with you in, uh, in Marrakech. I think a very fitting place uh, to celebrate what is basically the 10 years of our activities in, uh, in Morocco. Um, 10 years in which uh, uh, the EBRD is the, is the last one arrived in the, in the landscape of the international financial institutions. But I think 10 years where the bank really found its place in this landscape, uh, and through this have learned uh, quite a lot about where we see the, the business opportunities, and that's sort of the topic of today, trying to get you a good sense of where we think uh, you, know, you, you should focus and how to do good business in, uh, in Morocco. So in the last 10 years, we, uh, we invested over 3.2 billion uh, euros in the, in the Moroccan economy, um, with 70% of it being the private sector, and today uh, EBRD is the most active IFI uh, in the private sector in, uh, in Morocco. Um, we, uh, we also not only provide finance, we, we think the, you know, it, it's also a lot about expertise. So we have these advisory services for SME, which uh, we, also, we, uh, we leverage our uh, regional network of uh, the Tanger office and the Agadir office. And we have supported 700 SMEs since 2012 uh, with various uh, uh, advisory assignments. And lastly, I think another key, uh, a key uh, metric of our business uh, is uh, the fact that for the first uh, time last year, over half of our business was uh, green. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you a bit more about, uh, you know, give you a bit more flavor of what it was. So we are basically in Morocco uh, following three big priorities. Uh, the first one is really how can EBRD help the Moroccan economy shift from a model that is still very much driven by uh, public investment to an economy that is more uh, private sector led. And that's, you know, uh, the diagnostic of the, of the new development model, uh, the idea that we need to, uh, to really uh, scale up the, the, the private sector investment. And in that uh, area, we invested uh, over 1.6 billion uh, euros since, uh, since 2012 uh, with some really like um, uh, measurable results. Uh, when we look, for example, at uh, the way we've been helping SMEs, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, we see that uh, these activities of EBRD help SMEs increase their turnover. And we created, together with our SME partner, over 320 million euros of incremental uh, turnover. Uh, and we'll speak, uh, uh, I think, 
a lot about automotive uh, in this hour, but this is really an area where we, we built critical scale. We, uh, we invested uh, close to uh, over 200 million euros in uh, automotive and aeronautics, uh, which are really uh, the you know, sectors where we know Morocco has built comparative advantage and we want to help the sector continue to, uh, to scale and, 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 and get more integrated in global value chains. But also EBRD in Morocco, the idea was to show that we can be very reactive to, uh, to, uh, to events and, 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 and challenges. And I think the COVID crisis really demonstrated the way we, we operated. We are traditionally an investment bank. We, invent, we, we finance CapEx plans. But during COVID, the priority was not on investment anymore. It was on cash. And we didn't want to see companies go under because good companies with viable business model uh, go under uh, for a lack of liquidity. So we completely shifted our all financing uh, uh, range of, of instruments from financing in investments to financing liquidity. Um, and we continue to see key opportunities for the, for the, the, the year ahead, increasing finance of, of corporate and SMEs uh, to make them more competitive and more integrated in global value chains. Um, Morocco is a gateway to Africa, and um, uh, tomorrow this will be a discussion of our governor as to you know, where, whether EBRD can play a role in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, once it will be decided, it will put us in a very good position to continue to support uh, uh, um, expansion of Moroccan groups in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But we're also uh, going to looking with a lot of interest at uh, you know, the large PPP programs that are coming up, uh, notably in desalination. The second important priority for us at TBRD is making sure that this growth, that is going to be more private sector-led, benefits to everyone. Um, we still see that this is a, an area where Maria had, Morocco had some tremendous successes, uh, and a rate of growth that had allowed uh, a significant decrease in poverty. But there are still some categories that are not benefiting enough from, uh, from that prosperity. Uh, we see that uh, women uh, participation in the labor market is too low and in fact is decreasing. And that can definitely be a, a pool of talent that can be a relay for, for that growth. And for that, so we invested uh, 400 million euros since 2012. Um, and the idea is to really to, have, to, to access economic opportunities, you need to be armed with the right skills. And uh, Adil will you know, probably speak uh, much better than I uh, about this topic, but when we work in automotive, we don't only finance capacity expansion, but we also uh, work with the private sector and vocational training institutions to make sure that what young graduates, young engineers learn are really what the private sector needs in terms of skills. Uh, we supported uh, women entrepreneurs with uh, uh, um, 25 million euros of uh, women in business program and uh, uh, 220 uh, women in business uh, dispersed already. And they also uh, look to uh, uh, economic opportunities is also about access to service. So we uh, finance some large uh, infrastructure programs around access to water where today, thanks to this, close to 500,000 people have access to water that are uh, in line with WHO drinking water dr guidelines, as well as a rural electrification program with uh, now 40,000 people that are uh, connected to the grid thanks to that. Um, the last priority, which is one on which really uh, Morocco is, is already playing a leading role, which is green, green transition. Um, in our country, when we look at uh, you know the ambition on the, on uh, uh, that we express at COP26, uh, clearly Morocco com comes on the really among the top of our of our countries, and this is uh, an area we play. We 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 invested quite significantly, uh, over 800 million euros since 2012 with uh, uh, investment that managed to uh, achieve 730,000 tons of CO2 reduction uh, per year. Uh, that was through like, the financing of some uh, landmark uh, renewable projects. We were uh, notably financing um, uh, Morocco's largest wind farm, which was also one of the first private sector projects uh, in uh, Morocco under the law 1309, uh, which is basically the equi equivalent of removing 44,000 cars off the road. And we are now uh, working on uh, uh, Africa's very first wind farm uh, repowering. Um, 
a focus on, on the way we work with banks on this because I think this is really, uh, Morocco is a, is, a, is a tremendous success in that regard. This is one uh, of the countries where our intimidated lines, green lines, are the most successful. Uh, so we uh, already uh, distributed uh, over 400 million euros of, uh, of credit lines that are supporting green projects through diff three different programs. So the MORSEF was the, was the first one, then you had the green value chains, and we uh, now completely placed our green economy financing facility. We had an number of 160 million euros. Um, and that shows it's, it's, there's appetite from, from, from uh, the banks because behind there is a lot of appetite from, from the private sector because they understand uh, you know, how uh, decarbonization can be a lever of competitivity. Um, we see still a tremendous opportunities in, the, in that regard, uh, financing directly, uh, you know, project finance, IPPs. Um, um, but tomorrow, if we see the finally uh, changes in the regulatory framework that will allow, uh, uh, we unlock the corporate PPA market uh, to the medium voltage segments that will really allow industrials, Moroccan industrials to set up their own renewable uh, operations, that can be a very a game changer. Um, green hydrogen is, a, is one big theme that is talked about and according to our analysis, Morocco could have one of the lowest levelized costs of uh, hydrogen production in the world um, and uh, with access to, uh, to key markets that are uh, next door. Um, this is, uh, this is basically what I wanted to, uh, to leave you with in terms of you know, what we've been doing in the last 10 years and what is going to keep us busy uh, in, the, in the next 10. Uh, we've been working with some of uh, Morocco's biggest investors, uh, whether inter international or, or domestic, and uh, you know, we'll be uh, very happy to, uh, to work with you if you're interested in Morocco. Um, and i give you back uh, the floor, Anna. Thank you very much, Antoine, and indeed a very rich 10-year uh, history and clearly plenty of exciting things to come. Um, now I would like to turn to my colleague Adil. Adil, you were looking at the list of those clients and I could tell you were probably part of every single transaction that, <laughs> that occurred. Um, the question for you is on the SMEs uh, now. So SMEs are an important part of Moroccan economy. So can you tell us something about how EBRD is supporting them and how is uh, EBRD uh, supporting the sector in the country and maybe share some examples? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, very happy to be here with you um, to share a little bit more about what we do here in Morocco. And actually, when I was looking at the list, I was thinking more about the fact that Otwan has said everything that there should be said. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but uh, one thing is true is, is uh, in, in the details that Antoine has shared with us is that we, we've come a long way and has been a rich um, decade uh, trying to add value in the country different levels, different, uh, different ways, different mechanisms, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, one thing for sure is, as you mentioned, Anna, uh, SMEs are definitely at the heart of our action, but not just SMEs, SMEs and non-SMEs. So it's, it's the whole private sector. Um, and, and the idea is to adapt our offer so that SMEs are served as well as, as, as non-SMEs. But one thing for sure is that it has not been easy all the way in the sense that at first, when we arrived in 2012, 2013, uh, you know, still an unknown, uh, unknown to the place, um, uh, basically needing to understand more the needs uh, on the ground, uh, what, what is our value added uh, or added uh, value proposition. Um, all of this, you know, we had to work a little bit on the commercial side, on the commercial aspects of our offer. Um, on, uh, on uh, you know, getting the bank known, working a little bit on our processes, as you, everybody knows, uh, you know, uh, uh, development banks are, are branded as somewhat, uh, you know, that take a bit more time, a bit more complex. We had to work through all of that to make sure that we, for, for example, clients such as Toyoto can come to us and we can serve them and, and, and give them what they need in the right time with the right speed and with the right uh, uh, products. So what we do, uh, there is, as Antoine said, there is an aspect which is purely uh, technical assistance to try, especially to SMEs, where clearly money doesn't do it all. So you can have all the money and the financing in the world, but if you, if you do not have access to the right uh, expertise, the right technical um, 
uh, yeah, know-how, and I think uh, Hassan is, is best positioned to talk about that, then basically you will not be able to realize your, your potential. So what we do with, with SMEs is try to incentivize them to use uh, the right technical assistance. Um, and then obviously on the financial side, you know, financing, just trying to make sure that, again, our products are tailor-made, uh, answer the needs of, of, uh, of the companies on the ground, and they come at the right time and the right speed. However, we are not a commercial bank. We are a development bank, and this whole thing uh, uh, is, is all about trying to ensure that there is durability, sustainability, and uh, that we uh, encourage certain, let's say, um, habits and themes in the, invest in the investing uh, 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 you know, uh, phase. And it, it happened to be that a lot of our themes or the themes that we're trying to push, namely, you know, for example, value chains or the creation or, or the, uh, the development of the value chains, uh, as well as everything that is uh, around the green, green investments, uh, um, uh, the use of uh, renewable energies, uh, energy efficiencies, and, and, and so on and so forth. They happen to be themes that the country itself was kind of pushing one way or the other. So it was a bit easy for us to um, uh, s'inscrire or to put ourselves in, you know, in, in, in along the same lines. We just needed to make sure that we um, have the right incentives for SMEs and non-SMEs to actually um, uh, you know, go go along these uh, these themes or these um, uh, you know sustainability, let's say, themes that that we try to uh, uh, to push, and and all of this has given us exactly what Antoine was saying, which is after ten years, uh, more than three billion in investments. Uh, thank God, a good notoriety on the ground. Um, we have people that can attest to that, and and others obviously, um, and we're willing to continue. Uh, bringing and adding value to, to, to companies, SMEs and, on, and non-SMEs um, to, to make sure that the economy of a country like Morocco can continue to, to grow, especially with all the given uh, uh, you know, uncertainties. Thank you very much, Adil. And uh, we've heard from uh, my colleagues about the, the banking side and the financial side. And actually, I would like to turn to our clients now and maybe ask a little bit more about the uh, environment. And we are talking about investing with success in Morocco. So maybe, Hassan, over to you. Morocco has proven to be uh, a resilient investment destination, um, given all the global challenges the, the world is facing. What are some of the reasons for that, and what sort of competitive advantages the country has in your view? Thank you, thank you, Anna. I'm very happy to be here uh, to discuss about um, opportunities of investment here in Morocco. As you said, um, invest, Morocco is a land of investment. We have uh, one of the highest investment rates in the world, 30% of GDP uh, every year, which is invested. Um, and uh, we can speak about many factors, you know, stability, uh, geographical situation, labor cost. But as I represent, I would say, the private sector here, I would like to take an investor view on that. And why, as, an, as I said, as a private actor, I will invest in Morocco, and why we decided as private actors to decide to invest in Morocco. So first, we, we look at the past. And when we look at the past, what we see is uh, three things. One, the country risk of Morocco has been decreasing. We, Morocco has been one of the first countries in the continent to uh, use PPPs, which were very expensive. Today, thanks to the historical track record, thanks to uh, the confidence, the trust uh, that has been created, the, grant, the guarantee of the state, which was powerful, the country risk has been decreasing, and now we have a lot of opportunities to invest here in PPP in Morocco. Uh, and uh, with the, at rates and at returns that are quite comfortable, but still uh, also uh, with a risk that is quite uh, secure. Uh, the second thing that is important is, especially in the last two, 20 years, is the successes that we've seen in different sectors, in agriculture, in industry, automotive, offshoring, uh, and thanks to sector strategies that have been led by the countries, 
by the country, and, and we see that there are a lot of success stories, right? Uh, good exits uh, in private equity, we've been as in high, high actually, uh, ratios also in, uh, in the valuation of companies. And we have a lot of, uh, whether it is, you know, global companies or local companies that have been uh, actually performing quite well. And the third uh, element that we see in the past, and it's something very reassuring, is what happened in the COVID phase, right? When we, uh, we decided, the country decided to put, you know, to have a very strong response to COVID. On the economical side, a lot of decisions have been made to protect also the private sector through uh, demand, through uh, the banking system, the guarantees that have been made, more than 70 billion dollars in guarantee, uh, billion dirhams in guarantees that have been, in uh, credit that have been done for liquidity reasons. So also as a private actor, it's quite reassuring to see that the state is also here to support uh, the private sector when uh, it's, there is a big, a big shock. The second thing as a, an investor that you see is you know, today, what are the competitive factors that you have, right? So obviously, you have a very good infrastructure, whether it's in telecom, logistics, et cetera, lifestyle also, it's important also for an investor. But also, uh, not only infrastructure, we have also very good, as I see also for as a, an employer, a good quality of human resources, especially in management also. Uh, we have, uh, in, uh, in, um, in terms of managers that are uh, trained abroad, etc., we produce much more than what our economy is able to, to, uh, to support, actually. Uh, we have uh, just recently the social framework that has been signed, which also uh, is something quite appeasing for, for, uh, uh, and quite important. So, uh, and it's a young economy and a young population. So in terms of human resources, also something that is quite important in terms of for recruiting, which is a major uh, hassle today internationally, Morocco is quite well positioned. We can export quite easily. Uh, it's something uh, that we sometimes forget, but uh, there was a decision for openness of the, of the country with a lot of free trade agreements, whether in the US, now in Africa, preferential status with Europe. So this is something that sometimes we forget, but the Moroccan economy is too small also too. So if we are not seeing also what happens abroad, uh, and we have uh, the decision of the country to open, to be open has been quite uh, successful in terms of attracting investments. Uh, two other elements, uh, obviously, is uh, the banking system. Uh, here in Morocco, it's quite developed. In Africa, it's quite cheap. <coughs> For Morocco, it's quite cheap actually <coughs> to get funded in debt compared to others, so when we need liquidity, when we need, uh, uh, you know, uh, quick decisions on investment, we have uh, competition, we have uh, good, uh, quite good rates compared to what I, you know, the rates I have in Africa, for instance. So this is something which is also, people don't see it if they are not present in the country, and we are uh, quite, uh, quite l lucky, actually, to be, to, uh, to have this uh, way of funding. Uh, whether it is through local commercial bank, through DFIs, through, uh, through, uh, through um, you know, other debt, uh, debt institutions. And finally, also in terms of support, on a day-to-day -day support, uh, the new reform of uh, Les Centres Régionaux d'Investissement has been actually quite uh, uh, successful and uh, helping and supporting the, the private uh, investor to come and to be quick and to have quick authorization, to have uh, uh, one single gate, for, even for local, uh, for local pays before we had that for uh, inter FDIs, but also for local investors now, it's uh, getting easier and easier to, to invest. And then the third thing that we see as an investor is what's happening in the future, right? And here, uh, we, there is uh, the new development model, which is very ambitious. And it shows basically a royal vision of what Morocco uh, will uh, will be, uh, and it's quite reassuring to see that not only on the economical side but also on the social side everything is integrated, and we have a quite ambitious ambitious targets with plans uh, on the long on the medium to long term to to uh, to get to to that. Um, the second element in terms of competitive advantage, uh, a lot have been said around it is to tomorrow the main economical advantage will be green energy. And Morocco has the, probably one of the best potentials in the world to be there. So 
investors who are present today will benefit from this competitive advantage in the future. And we are going to get there, right? We are, we are condemned to go there. Today, there are still some regulations to, uh, to be changed, but we are going to be there because the world is, is, uh, is going to need actually this kind of energy. Uh, and the last thing is also what uh, the different mechanisms that are going to be created uh, for Mohammed Sis for investment. Uh, we also provide, will provide more liquidity for investment. The, the different measures in terms of, uh, of uh, simplification of uh, the regulation, etc. So all this uh, shows that the government has decided to, uh, uh, let's say, trust more the pre both international and local actors to make the development uh, happen today economically in the country. Thank you very much, Hassan. It seems that many different pieces of puzzle came in place, and uh, you used the word uh, lucky at one point, and you know what they say, the more I work, the luckier I get. So I think this current situation is actually a result of very hard work of Moroccan governments and entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and bankers on the ground. Um, we will now speak a little bit more about one model of investment, which is joint ventures, and we will hear from Mustafa who will speak uh, to us in, in French, and I will ask my question in English so that people can actually understand me. Um, uh, Mustafa, you are the CEO and main shareholder of Toyauto, um, one of the few 100% Moroccan-owned companies operating as a tier one supplier in the automotive sector. My mic is moving, apologies for this. You have also established a joint venture with Gestamp, uh, a global player in the stamping industry. And the question is, why only few Moroccan players are suppliers of major manufacturers, and why even fewer industri industries consider JVs with international leaders? So what should be done to encourage other Moroccan operators to invest in the sector and to consider joint ventures with their international operators? Okay. Le, le secteur automobile est considéré aujourd'hui comme uh, uh, un exemple de, de succès, mais on oublie souvent de voir uh, OK, c'est mieux. Je, je disais donc uh, le, le secteur automobile est, est fait effectivement une success story, mais ça ne s'est pas fait sans, sans douleur, sans souffrance, sans rupture. Et, et, et pour répondre à cette question, surtout la première partie est relative au, à l'absence de, euh, au peu, au nombre peu important d'acteurs locaux euh, rang 1 du secteur automobile, je suis obligé de revenir à vous faire un peu l'histoire du secteur depuis, euh, depuis l'indépendance du Maroc. Je vais le faire rapidement en deux phases. Il y a une phase de 1960 à 1995-2000 qui est celle euh, des, 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 des politiques nationales de planification industrielle et, et dans le secteur automobile cela s'est construit autour d'un acteur important qui est la Somaca qui est un, une unité d'assemblage automobile euh, là, là dessus euh, beaucoup d'acteurs de, 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 marocains se sont mis en place et on commençait à, à produire, à se spécialiser dans des, dans des fonctions, des composants. Euh, nous, nous, tu auto c'était le système d'échappement. On avait des confrères qui fabriquaient des, des radiateurs, des batteries, des amortisseurs. Vous avez vécu ça en Tunisie aussi. Des, mais, mais ce sont des acteurs qui étaient extrêmement euh, agiles, mais qui, qui avaient développé des, des compétences sur le, les séries courtes avec des catalogues importants et avec des solutions très, très innovantes mais orientées autour de leur marché local seuls deux acteurs internationaux étaient présents c'était des pneumaticiens donc on avait des, deux, deux fabricants de pneumatiques qui étaient des joint ventures l'une entre l'état marocain et un pneumaticien international et l'autre entre un groupe marocain privé et, et un autre pneumaticien. Euh, cette politique a été renforcée en 1980 par une loi dite de l'intégration compensation qui obligeait les, les, les constructeurs ou les marques automobiles qui voulaient vendre des véhicules au Maroc à 
exporter ou produire au Maroc une 40 à 60% de, de chiffre d'affaires euh, réalisé. Donc, intégrer, produire au Maroc ou, ou exporter, compensation. Et, et tous les constructeurs, toutes les marques automobiles qui n'entraient pas dans ce, dans, dans ce, de, dans ce schéma euh, avaient payé des droits de douane extrêmement élevés, ce qui fait que beaucoup de constructeurs que l'on voit actuellement couramment étaient absents. À titre d'exemple, Audi vendait, je crois, 40 ou 50 véhicules à l'année au Maroc. Donc, c'était une politique très, euh, très orientée économiquement et, et qui a permis d'atteindre un niveau euh, où le secteur représentait 5 à 10 000 emplois, mais euh, avec une très faible euh, projection à l'international. Cela a conduit au moment de, de la libéralisation, donc les accords du GATT, l'accord de libre-échange avec l'Union européenne. Euh, la libéralisation du Maroc a fait que toutes ces protections qui étaient mises en place sont tombées euh, les unes après les autres. Et, et ça a mis donc ces, ces acteurs devant euh, une situation où il fallait en, en cinq ans à peu près passer complètement revoir et leur stratégie industrielle, leur modèle industriel, leur panel de clients. C'était un challenge important. Et ce challenge, malheureusement, a été très difficile à passer. Beaucoup d'acteurs locaux n'ont pas pu y résister, mais aussi les internationaux. J'ai parlé tout à l'heure de deux équipementiers internationaux dans les pneumatiques. Tous les deux ont fermé autour de, de, des années 2000. Et donc, pendant que cette destruction euh, se faisait, naissait euh, euh, d'une manière très rapide un, un cluster important qui est celui du câblage automobile qui, en 3-4 ans, a apporté 30 000 ou 35 000 emplois, là où on était en train d'en perdre 5 000 à 10 000. Donc, euh, perte d'un côté, perte d'emplois, mais perte aussi de certains savoir-faire, mais en contrepartie, arrivée, un, arrivée extrêmement rapide et extrêmement importante d'un cluster câblage qui a compensé, en tout cas en termes d'emplois. Voilà, ça c'est... Autour de 2000-2005, franchement, Tuyoto, comme les autres, n'avait plus aucune raison de, de survivre. Et si nous avons survécu, c'est un peu parce que nous, avons un, un plus grand, nous avions un plus grand attachement à cette société. Les, les, les actionnaires ont décidé de, de refaire un dernier plan d'investissement sur trois ans avec mise à niveau de l'appareil productif dans une orientation qualité et performance, mais c'était clairement le dernier. Et, et ils l'ont fait sans que une visible, des projets visibles soient, euh, soient projetés. Nous avons la, la chance en 2005 de, de voir Renault arriver à la Somaca. Ça a été la première phase. Somaca était en train de s'écrouler. Hein. 10 000 ou 15 000 véhicules étaient produits, n'étaient plus produits. Était, était produit et bon, elle était vouée à l'arrêt. Renault est arrivé en 2005 et, et, et a porté un premier, un, premier, euh, un premier saut en, en faisant passer la production à 40 ou 50 000, mais d'un seul véhicule. Et ça, ça, ça a été un premier, euh, une première bouée de sauvetage. Évidemment, euh, 2008, euh, Renault a annoncé son projet de Tanger et là, on est passé d'une un, situation euh, d'autarcie ou de, vers, vers une, une situation de croissance importante qui a duré jusqu'à aujourd'hui. On, on, on a été retenu par euh, Renault pour les accompagner à, à Tanger parce qu'ils nous connaissaient. On avait travaillé ensemble à, à Somaka. Et, et parce que euh, très important sur ce projet, euh, quelque chose qui, qui dans l'automobile était, était essentiel, c'est que euh, le, le, la recherche et développement sur les produits qu'on fabriquait était propriété de Renault. 
Donc ça, ça permettait à Renault de, de choisir librement son partenaire. Alors que souvent dans l'automobile, les équipementiers premiers, euh, premier rang sont propriétaires de, de l'ingénierie et, et, et arrivent à, à empêcher le constructeur d'avoir une stratégie plus agressive sur le plan de, de leur panel. Voilà, donc ça, ça, ça répond à votre première question, pourquoi il y a très peu d'acteurs marocains on en aurait eu plus s'ils avaient pu passer ce cap de, cap de l'an 2000, le bug de l'an 2000 qui a été, qui a, qui a été très dur. Alors, le, le second volet de votre question concerne les, les JV. Concerne les JV. Bon, il, y a, il y a très peu de JV, effectivement. Aujourd'hui, 250 acteurs internationaux se sont installés au Maroc sur les dix dernières années, euh, des JV, on peut en compter trois ou quatre. Euh, pour, 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 en tout cas, pour moi, les raisons de, cette, de cet état, c'est d'abord que la réputation du Maroc n'est plus à faire, euh, avec des zones industrielles aux normes mondiales, des packages d'incentives extrêmement attrayants, mais pas que sur le papier, les gens, les gens se rendent compte que quand on promet, on, 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 on fait. Et puis, une population active, jeune et, et, et travailleuse. Tout ça fait que les appréhensions qu'un équipementier euh, pourrait avoir euh, autour de l'installation au Maroc, liées au risque pays, à la culture, euh, n'existent pas. Hein. Aujourd'hui, quel que ce soit le Japon, les états unis une, un équipement qui a une décision à prendre, il va appeler son, son confrère qui est déjà présent au Maroc, il va lui dire écoutez, allez-y, c'est vraiment euh, très facile. Dans ce sens, euh, ils pas, euh, il, il n'y a pas d'intérêt à faire de JV. La, la deuxième, le deuxième point, c'est que les projets euh, euh, qui sont réalisés au Maroc par les constructeurs, sont des projets qui sont au cœur de leur stratégie. Et surtout Renault. Euh, Stellantis bientôt, mais, mais Renault aujourd'hui, ce qui est tangé est au cœur de sa stratégie. Et, et un équipementier, quand il s'agit de projets qui sont au cœur de, de la stratégie du constructeur, euh, a envie d'être libre, de faire ses choix, d'accompagner et, et de ne pas se... Euh, s'embêter avec des partenariats. Et la troisième chose, moi je l'ai constaté, nous, nous, nous sortons d'une période où, où la santé financière des équipementiers était solide. Euh, les, les financements sont là, ils sont, ils sont à peu près gratuits. Hein. Et, et tout ça fait que, bon, en l'absence d'une contrainte financière, on n'a pas besoin d'un partenaire financier. Ah oui, j'avais un dernier point sur, sur les JV. Par contre, là où les JV peuvent être très intéressantes, c'est pour euh, développer le tissu industriel de plus petite taille. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, tous les grands sont présents, mais par contre, il faudrait que cette, euh, cette euh, industrie diffuse, chez des, dans le tissu, diffuse le tissu industriel rang 2-3, sorte de Tanger à Kenitra pour aller partout au Maroc sur des métiers nouveaux, etc. Et là, il faudrait mettre en, en contact des, des, des petits acteurs euh, européens avec des petits acteurs marocains. Les petits acteurs européens n'ayant pas la structure ni le, les moyens financiers d'être présents et de piloter au Maroc leurs activités, ils peuvent s'appuyer sur le partenaire marocain et, et autour de ce type de sujet, l'AJV est, est un outil qui peut être précieux. Thank you very much, and this was actually really interesting, both the overview and, and the, the advice that, that you gave. Um, and now maybe over uh, again to, to you, Antoine, and um, I'll change the topic a little bit so we can now talk a little bit about green and sustainable. So green is at the core of the uh, energy transition for the EBRD. So can you tell us how is EBRD helping Morocco transition to a more sustainable future? On green here in Morocco, it's 
it's, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to do business as, a, as an institution like EBRD because we see really that, you know, basically really Morocco thinks uh, uh, about green as exactly the same way as we do at EBRD, which is, yes, of course, the global environmental challenges, but also as an economic opportunity and really one of the key levers for the private sector to increase its competitiveness. In the Livre Blanc uh, publié, published in October by uh, the CGM, it's very clear, uh, uh, electric prices in Morocco are still 20% higher than sort of uh, the, the, the peer set uh, of, of Morocco. Um, we know that tomorrow uh, at the border of Morocco's largest export market, you will have new tariff uh, based on carbon uh, with moving target in terms of, uh, of, of implementation. But this is all really in the mind of entrepreneurs in Morocco. And that's really in our discussion. Therefore, when we speak about financing capacity expansion, there's always very easily the green angle comes into the discussion. Um, and so we, 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 we have developed a range of tools to support that. So whether it's, it's directly, as uh, Adil was, uh, was mentioning, and I think one of the sort of like advantage we have at EBRD is that we, we can start looking at um, financing directly from a relatively uh, low ticket, you know, from sort of 3 million euros. This is, uh, you know, uh, 30 million dirhams. This is something that we could consider financing directly. Because for us, it's very important that to have this relationship with the, with the client. Uh, we can, all, of course, finance also in, in, in Moroccan dirham, which is uh, an important uh, particularity also of, of EBRD. But when we cannot, when it's this, these are you know, sort of smaller in investment plans, then, then we do it through our partner banks, uh, which we have many, uh, and I see uh, uh, a few in, uh, in the audience, um, which, you know, with, which we have co-created also those, those green products. You know? And that's why also they work so well here is because we've thought with our partner banks, what can work? They know their clients best. And uh, so we have those green lines, which are uh, have, uh, an element of, of uh, a CapEx uh, subvention, uh, CapEx grant, which is financed by the EU, which I, I would like to thank uh, uh, a lot for their, for, their, for their support for this. And this is working very well, and we want to continue and scale this. Um, so this is, this is for the private sector, but we also, Morocco had a leading a really uh, role in, in infrastructure and as we were saying previously in, uh, in IPPs, so the sort of first large scale private sector projects uh, in renewables uh, in the continent were done in, 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 in Morocco. Um, and, and the banks also have acquired clearly, you know, they have very strong structuring skills on project finance, which is we see in, in a lot of our countries, we co-finance with other FIs, but here in, in Morocco, we you can see that less and less IFIs are needed because commercial banks are you know, financing this, this last project. And so we very often work in pool uh, with, uh, with those local banks. Um, and, and the last aspect that is important on green is, of course, is the regulation. Um, and here, um, Morocco is actually the only country in our uh, region that has an independent regulator. So you have a regulator that only reports to, uh, to the parliament. And this is really key. If you want to start having a governance that really works um, um, in terms of you know, having the, the right prices, the right incentives, and so working a lot with the, with the regulator, uh, help them uh, you know, publish the first grid code that basically sets the, the, the rules for connecting to the grid, um, working also on what should be the grid fee tomorrow for a private uh, operator to get connected um, to the grid. And also another important uh, topic is uh, uh, green certificates, certificates of, of origins. It's great to have all this green energy, uh, but you need to be able to say that it comes from, uh, it's, come from it's, it's green. And so we're working with, uh, on this with the Ministry of Energy that will be very important in the context of CBAM, but also of green hydrogen uh, to be able to label uh, your, uh, your um, energy and hydrogen uh, green. Thank you very much. And uh, I think this is, uh, generally one of the keys of EBRD success, listening to the clients and tailoring our products to their needs is both uh, that you and uh, Adil said. So um, Adil, over to you um, and coming back to why Morocco is an interesting FDI destination. So from your experience, what are the sectors uh, that are um, fostered by EBRD and why should a company invest in Morocco? It's a big question. We yeah, just need a brief answer. 
Okay, definitely. Um, and I think on, on, on why they should invest, I think uh, Hassan was, was trying to, to answer earlier on. But um, uh, clearly, in terms of, of, of sectors, I guess we're, we're sector agnostic. I mean, at the end of the day, as long as the, the, the investment or the capex that will be in place will help you know, a company grow, create jobs, create wealth, add value, and so on, and as long as the business model and, and the whole, uh, let's say, um, uh, the, the whole uh, investment exercise is accretive, then we're, we're willing to, to look at and, and support. As you know, we have the, the themes that, that we have to follow uh, in terms of our strategy, green, inclusive, um, and digital. So obviously we have to stick to these uh, three pillars, main pillars of our strategy. But I think what, what, what we need to probably focus on a, a bit more is, is a couple of, of points that, that either need to be uh, addressed or are being addressed right now to facilitate both FDIs as well as, as, as local Morocco, uh, Moroccan companies to continue investing. One clearly is is um, is land, industrial land. Industrial land needs to be needs to be cheaper, needs to be more competitive because it, at, at the end of the day, it it hits the the whole competitiveness of of the company and of the investment itself. Um, uh, and a lot a lot has been done, but a lot still needs to be done. I think Hassan agrees. On the financing side, I think between us, between the local banks, between the other IFIs, I think we're we're. We're well covered. It's, it's a sophisticated market. However, companies need to start looking outside a little bit the, the classical banking products. They need to start thinking about you know more hybrid products. Uh, the, 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 the whole private sector, again, uh, is extremely over leveraged, extremely over leveraged. And I, on, on the same uh, or on the other uh, side of the coin, extremely undercapitalized. And that's something that needs to be, uh, you know, quickly addressed because it, ca it it blocks or it's an obstacle to continuing investment because certain companies just cannot finance themselves anymore. So that's a, a small hint to local Morocco Moroccan companies to start opening up and start thinking about, you know, uh, adding more capital, adding more equity, and that comes with obviously a few other things, you know, governance. You know, you can't just, you know, ask private capital to come in. But anyway, that's that's a whole different story. Market is extremely important. It was mentioned that the Moroccan market is small, so that's why we need to look at if there is a local market, if there is a, 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 you know import substitution, that's one thing. Otherwise, you need to look at either north or south, so exports. Qualified labor, extremely important. That, that's something we work on. Uh, Antoine mentioned it earlier on. We work a lot with the ministries, for example, the Ministry of Industry. We've done a, a number of policy dialogues to make sure that, for example, the automotive and the aer aerospace sectors that are, you know, in, in full, uh, you know, development, that basically you identify the the key, let's say, um, uh, uh, required skills and make sure that we can we know where to bring them, and if we cannot, then we put in place the right, uh, you know, curricula to have, you know, students and, and people that come out of universities that can, you know, get those right skills and be uh, employable. Somebody mentioned cost of energy, I think uh, Antoine or uh, Hassan, but basically that's extremely important. We cannot, how can you ask investors, private investors that need to be competitive, especially if we're talking about the export market, when they're paying 20% more than you know the neighbor uh, uh, up north. I know a lot is being done on the regulatory aspects and Antoine mentioned it, but that needs to be uh, uh, accelerated uh, very quickly. And last but not least, basically you need to make sure that the, the, the right competitive value chain is there. So. Uh, uh, people are able to, or, or operators are able to buy the right, whatever be the raw material they need to produce whatever they need to produce, but at a competitive uh, 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 rate. And that is linked directly or indirectly to logistics. So again, a, a small hint to you know, improved and more competitive uh, logistics. I don't know if I've, if I've answered your question, but I think indirectly I have. You did, and I am now inclined to ask 15 more, but in the interest of time, I will move and maybe later we can talk. But I think what you mentioned is also very important. We know that the banking system is very mature in Morocco, and maybe on the financing side, IFIs are not as needed, but clearly on the policy dialogue side, along the list that you just gave us, there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, and actually, the last uh, uh, point on your list was about global value chains, and um, I would like to ask Hassan more about that. So, in your, in your view, 
um, what should the country do to continue developing um, FDI investments, and especially in the context of the ongoing discussions on the global value chains? So, earlier on, um, I spoke about the 30% investment uh, in rate. The reality is that a lot of it is actually uh, done by the public sector. And if we go into FDIs, it has been in a decreasing trend, right, uh, over, the last, uh, over, over the last years. And uh, I believe that one of the reasons of this decreasing trend is uh, that we uh, arrived at the end of the some sector strategies that need to be refreshed, and that we are lacking today a layer, which is what we call a, a country offer on some sectors. Right. So if we take automotive or, or offshoring or, or what we have been called uh, the Les Nouveaux Métiers du Maroc, there were a clear, in, uh, let's say, incentive package and incentive value proposition of the country back in 2007, 2008. Right. And, and that was very clear to investors. You come, you have land at this price, fiscal uh, re, uh, rates for the, the first five years, etc. Uh, incentives for recruiting, you know, this kind of things. And today, and we had also mechanisms that are quite strong. The Fonds de Développement Agricole for Agriculture, the Fonds de Développement Industriel for Industry, for Logistics, etc. So we had also some mechanisms that were embedded in the sector strategies. Today, uh, for the last five years, we, we arrived basically at the end of the sector strategies, and we, uh, we took some time to do this investment charter that just uh, coming out, and we are expecting the new wave, basically, of, uh, of these strategies to be, to have some things to sell on a sector way, uh, different from just, as I said, stability and political situation and free trade agreements, etc. Now, and that's what actually an investor is looking for, because Morocco, be because it's open, it's in competition with all the other relevant uh, to that. So, that being said, uh, within the CGM, we uh, wrote uh, a livre blanc uh, that I encourage everyone to read because I think it's quite good, uh, mm -hmm. where, <laughs> where basically uh, we had a lot of uh, recommendation coming actually from the private sector on each sector, but also a series of, uh, let's say, transversal priorities that we would like to push also. And one of them, and I think the first one, is the diversification of financial mechanisms, right? Because, uh, as you said, and we are completely, we completely agree with that, is the undercapitalization uh, and the over leverage of, uh, of the private, especially SMEs. And it came also with, through the responses that has been made by the COVID response, because uh, the way we basically, uh, all the losses, we put that over five to seven years, through, thanks to, through the debt, but the reality is that at the end of the day, it's the companies who supported the cost of, uh, of, of the crisis. And, and because of that, the companies now are lacking uh, other financial ways. And that's why at the same mo moment, if you remember, uh, the, the decision on, on Daman was the, was the form Mohamed Sis at the same time, because that was going to be the, 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 the counterpart on debt to provide uh, quasi-equity or systematic quasi-equity as has been done in Europe, etc. But today we are still all too conservative in our ways of funding. So if either it's the private equity or debt uh, classical tech, everything in between is very, is very uh, not developed, basically. And this is something where we see a lot of potential also to come in. I think the second uh, area is there are some sectors that are still over-regulated. Uh, fintech, for instance, uh, 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 everything that is linked also to digital, uh, pri private public sector is not playing its role as a, as a, let's say, as a, as a buyer or as a, as a catalyst for that. Uh, so this, uh, a lot of regulations of Morocco in Morocco has been inherited, so that needs to be refreshed. And there are some elements, especially in insurance, in financial sector, et cetera, where we don't benefit from all the innovations that come in, in the continent. Not, I'm not speaking about Europe, but what's happening actually in the African continent. We don't benefit from it. As I, I always like to say that out of the 10 startups that have been the Y Combinators last year, nine of them would have been illegal in Morocco. 
right? So this is not something that is uh, in line with the, the willingness of Morocco to be as a, you know, as a, uh, as a, uh, a developed country on, on the innovation side. But this is also there are plans also to work in the new development model has been put the vision, but there's still this, uh, as I said, this layer of implementation plan that needs, that needs to happen. And I think the third, uh, the third part is, um, uh, is also about the role of the state in the economic space. Uh, to basically be more um, as a regulator rather than uh, than an operator, and it's going to to move. It's moving slowly about on that, but there are some uh, some good signs, especially like in the health sector today, with the with the social security plan, to put also the the public actors in competition with the private actors, and I think that's uh, actually quite. Uh, um, uh, it's like it's uh, healthy, right? To, and, and, and to, so that everybody can actually improve its quality, etc. So there are also opportunities in the future, including in some public uh, services. Uh, we started with energy, we went to transportation, tomorrow it's going to be healthcare, education, etc. And that's why we see more and more actors, international actors, private equity funds that are investing in this sector because we see that tomorrow uh, these, these are the next layers in terms of uh, development sectors. Thank you very much. So clearly a lot of work for government, but also equity people. Um, yes. I, could, I could read that. And maybe the, the last question for today from me, and then we will turn to our audience, is for you, um, Mustafa. So today the export of uh, automotive sector exceeds um, 85 billion MED, which is around uh, 8 billion euros. So can you maybe tell us, share some ideas, how to increase this and how to uh, have these revenues reach maybe 150 or 200 billion. Um, I can keep up, <laughs> but uh, maybe, maybe let's start with some first steps on what could be done. Could some new suppliers enter? What, uh, uh, what are the steps? Yes. In fact, when we talk about the development of the sector automobile in Maroc, we ask tout de suite la question. Le troisième constructeur et, et pour quand ouais. Bon, certes, euh, c'est quelque chose... Avoir un troisième constructeur et, et serait souhaitable, mais ça reste hypothétique. C'est hypothétique d'autant plus qu'on est en train de changer de paradigme, surtout en Europe. On, on sort d'une période de forte croissance. Là, le secteur automobile de notre région entre dans une période de, de, de maturité, voire même de décroissance. Si on ajoute à ça toutes les mutations technologiques qui, 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 qui se présentent, euh, l'effet volume ne doit pas être le seul levier de, de développement que nous souhaitons pour le Maroc. En tout cas, nous avons au Maroc 700 000 voitures de, de, installées hein, de, de, sur les, les trois chaînes de montage, mais nous n'avons pas pu dépasser les 600 000 hein, en termes de, de production. Nous n'avons pas pu atteindre les 700 000 euh, parce que Covid, parce que l'année dernière, problème de composants électroniques, cette année aussi, problème de composants électroniques, euh, malheureusement, euh, alors même que les usines de, de, des constructeurs ainsi que leurs écosystèmes performent à un niveau vraiment très intéressant. Hein. Ils sont dans la moyenne de, de la performance des usines européennes, même si elles sont encore neuves, hein, jeunes. Alors, en, en revanche, je pense qu'il faudrait plus se focaliser sur la valeur ajoutée, donc sur les, les 80 ou 90 milliards de dirhams de de chiffre d'affaires, on a 30 milliards de, de dirhams de valeur ajoutée locale. Et, et c'est là où on peut, sans faire, sans faire beaucoup évoluer le chiffre d'affaires, on peut imaginer 100 milliards, mais bon, ça serait, ça serait un, un bel objectif. Par contre, on, peut, on devrait faire pousser le curseur de l'intégration euh, locale et de la valeur ajoutée locale. Euh, pour moi, sur la, la période future, c'est là où il faut travailler. J'ai quelques exemples. Le premier, 
c'est autour de la R&D. Euh, une voiture, c'est énormément de, de R&D. Euh, les, les, les équipementiers internationaux euh, présents au Maroc font très peu de, de R&D au Maroc. Alors même que l'un des deux constructeurs, Stellantis, a, est en train de mettre en place un projet de R&D fantastique. Euh, ils ont aujourd'hui 3000 ingénieurs à Casablanca. Ils sont en train d'installer tout un écosystème de, de, de laboratoires, de, de pistes d'essai, qui va faire que dans les quelques années à venir, euh, l'objectif, c'est de concevoir, dessiner concevoir et, et produire euh, un véhicule au Maroc, un profil de véhicule au Maroc. Quand on parle de profil de véhicule, c'est un véhicule sur une base existante. Euh, le, les bases sont communes à plusieurs véhicules, mais chaque véhicule est dessiné euh, de manière euh, pers personnalisée. Cet, cet exemple, donc 3000 ingénieurs et techniciens pour créer ça. Si, on a, si les équipementiers euh, mettent aussi une partie de leur R&D au Maroc, en tout cas pour l'Europe le, du Sud, c'est un levier très intéressant en termes de, 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 de valeur ajoutée et de, et, et de développement. Euh, en filigrane, un, un, en filigrane un, un, un sous-secteur, bon, c'est un peu technique, mais, mais qui est très intéressant aussi, c'est que euh, on peut estimer à 15% du chiffre d'affaires d'un programme véhicule le, le chiffre d'affaires qui est fait sur les moyens de réalisation du véhicule. Donc, euh, pour faire euh, un véhicule, il faut produire tout un tas d'équipements auto qui sont spécifiques, qui, sont, qui ne sont pas des machines, mais qui sont des moyens, euh, des, des outils d'emboutissage, des moules de, de, de plastique, des des installations d'intégration euh, robotisées ou manuelles. Et, et tout cela représente 15% de, du chiffre d'affaires sur la vie euh, d'un véhicule. Et, et tout ça est fait souvent par des acteurs de, de petite taille, euh, avec pas nécessairement euh, une exigence de capital très élevée. Et là, pour les jeunes, les jeunes ingénieurs marocains, il y, a, il y a un champ très intéressant pour accompagner déjà sur les projets euh, futurs au Maroc et puis très vite se projeter parce que ce sont les mêmes process qui, euh, qui, sont, qui sont utilisés euh, mondialement. Euh, bon, troisième, euh, troisième élément, il est, il est très lourd, c'est les matières premières. Euh, euh, on on sera toujours très limité euh, tant que sur l'acier, sur le verre, sur le polypropylène, nous n'avons pas euh, d'industrie installée. Et là, non seulement on, on, on est limité en valeur ajoutée, mais même en performance. Une entreprise telle que la mienne euh, subit, parce qu'elle reçoit son acier euh, de l'étranger, un coût euh, d'importation que, que mon concurrent en Espagne, par exemple, ne, ne subit pas. Et comme c'est des secteurs où, 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 où les prix sont extrêmement tirés, ça, ça, ça ruine euh, certains projets. L'acier, le, le verre, le polypropylène, tout de suite, c'est l'énergie. Et donc, c'est des défis d'une toute autre dimension. Si euh, ce qu'on est en train de d'entrevoir de, comme développement euh, d'énergie verte au Maroc euh, venait à atteindre ce secteur industriel là c'est véritablement un tournant qui, qui se présenterait pour nous voilà une, 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 un, un, un ou deux derniers euh, su, sujets c'est les toutes petites PME j'ai tout, tout à l'heure parlé des JV entre petits euh, et petits aujourd'hui il faudrait que l'industrie automobile sorte de, de la zone offshore de, de Tanger et de la zone Medzed à Khmetra et diffuse, euh, et diffuse de tout le pays. Euh, moi, moi j'espère je, qu'un jour, on aura un cluster mécanique à Wazen ou bien un cluster caoutchouc à, à Ben Slimane ou je ne sais. Et, et ça, c'est la faiblesse. On reste, les acteurs, rang 1, rang 2 sont présents 
mais il faut maintenant que euh, ce savoir-faire ce savoir industriel diffuse euh, le, le tissu industriel marocain euh, beaucoup plus profondément que, que ça ne l'est aujourd'hui. Voilà, ce, ce sont des pistes euh, que, que l'on pourra suivre. Thank you very much. Um, so now, maybe the time for our audience to ask a question or two. Um, I am a little bit blinded by the lights, but I think I will be able to see raised hands. So do we have any questions for our panelists today? Or did I ask them everything you ever wanted to know about investment with success in Morocco? I think, um, uh, yeah, do you have, please, if we can have the mic over to the gentleman in the third row. Thank you. Just following up on, uh, on the latest remark, uh, Monsieur, you, you, you hinted at the dichotomy that uh, the industrial uh, ecosystem sector strategies have created between, uh, and also between the uh, foreign companies and local companies. Um, I appreciate that EBRD has been quite active developing uh, a program working on the, uh, on the value chain. Uh, I think it's called the EBRD Trade and uh, Competitiveness Program. So maybe Antoine or, or Adil, if you could please uh, kindly expand on, the, on that point. Should I pick the winner, Adil? Over to you. Sure. <laughs> um, no, it, it's exactly, you're absolutely right, uh, in the sense that uh, th th that program is or has been uh, put together to exactly address that, in the sense that we have um, uh, most of the companies that, that, uh, that we work with are to a certain extent of a certain size and therefore um, have access to a lot of uh, know-how, means, uh, and so on, to be, to be able to operate and invest and, and, and continue, let's say, creating value in whatever sector it is. But let's say uh, we've been talking a lot about the automotive sector, so let's, let's continue talking about that. Um, now, clearly what they did not do in the past, and they still don't do, and that's what uh, Sir Harari was mentioning, is that most of what they do is still, or the people, pieces they use, you know, as raw materials still comes, is, is, is imported. And therefore, they do not pass on that know-how or that, uh, let's say, added value to other, you know, if they're tier two, then a tier three, and if tier three, then a tier four, and so on and so forth. But basically, they do not uh, allow smaller companies to benefit from an, uh, an existing developing sector and developing expertise. And so the whole idea behind the program that we have, which is the value chain program, is to encourage a company, for example, like Kyoto, which is of a, a certain size, to uh, work with smaller companies rather than going to an international company and buy, buy a product from them. Uh, well, Steel is a bit of a, a difficult one, but uh, in any case, uh, th there are other, there are other um, let's say, examples whereby clearly by, by helping smaller companies identifying what are the gaps. So basically, it, not anybody can just come up and say, tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a tier three or a tier four supplier in the automotive sector. There are certain criteria that are needed, uh, you know, know-how, uh, machinery, um, uh, you know, processes, and, uh, you know, a lot more. So you identify which company has that potential, and then we uh, uh, bring to this company the right technical assistance that will allow it to get whatever it is that it needs to be able to work, for example, with, uh, with Yoto. And then what we would do with Yoto is uh, incentivize them to do that. And how do you incentivize them? Well, it's very simple. You try to give them grants. It's, there's nothing, you know, cash is king. Nothing, nothing speaks better than, than, than cash. So basically, you, you start putting in place uh, uh, you know, grants and incentives that will allow Silgarari, for example, to say, you know what, I'm going to identify two, three, five suppliers in the Qanitara, Tangier, West Zen, Bin Sliman region, and I will work with them and make sure that in six months' time, one year's time, they are my uh, uh, suppliers. And that's how you win, basically, three to five companies, and you integrate them into the value chain when they will never, ev ever have thought about doing that nor been able to do that. Thank you, Adil. Any other final questions, quick ones? 
No, this is sold. Ah, you have one. Okay. This is the last one. First of all, thank you for the insights. I've sent my questions uh, throughout uh, Slido, but uh, basically they were not uh, uh, taken. So uh, the first one is uh, about the uh, willingness uh, of EBRD to leverage the local capital market, and especially or particularly the pool of liquidity available at the Casablanca Stock Exchange in order to expand the financing uh, offering. So this is the first question. What are your thoughts about this? And the uh, second one is about your equity portfolio. Are there any plans to divest? And uh, if this is the case, are you going to uh, use the uh, local uh, exchange again? Thank you. Thank and you. actually, on uh, the equity, we will have a dedicated session tomorrow around 3. So please come over and you will uh, learn everything from our experts. But I'll now hand over to my colleagues Thank you. for a brief answer. So um, Antoine, Adil. So um, I'll let maybe uh, Adil speak about the, the investment side uh, of things when we uh, uh, of our capital market operations. But uh, you know, we we definitely believe that capital markets, and in particular the stock exchange, needs to be uh, you know much more. It needs to be a relay for for the private sector to uh, to finance itself. It's still a very very sort of banking led uh, financial system. Um, and, and for this, there, there, there's a few building blocks also in terms of the policy that, uh, that need to be there. Um, and we worked a lot with uh, the Ministry of Finance, with uh, the IMMC, uh, with uh, Bank El Maghrib on, on various assignments, uh, on, the, on the, the framework for uh, private debt markets, um, setting up, uh, uh, amending the, the legislation for derivatives, which is something we've been waiting for a long time. And apparently, uh, we're starting to, getting, to get good signals that uh, that might go to Parliament uh, this year. Um, so th th these are the things that, you know, for us, are really important to get uh, to get functioning uh, capital markets. Uh, and we can be very active uh, as an uh, advocacy um, and, and, and with, with, with the policymakers. But we can be also very active as you know, providing liquidity and being an anchor investor in, uh, in, uh, in capital market uh, operations. On this, maybe, uh, Adil, you want to talk about uh, what the operations we did? Sure, sure. Well, for, first of all, the, 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 clearly the interest is there, and, and more than the interest, the willingness, and actually we, 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 we try to do a lot more um, on that front. Um, what needs to happen at the same time is that uh, a, a few things need to change in the sense that uh, th there is quite a bit of liquidity in the market, and liquidity, which is looking for somewhat, uh, you know, an easy way in terms of, you know, investing into capital market uh, transactions. So in terms of documentations and, and things linked to, to that. Um, and so we, we have certain criteria and we would love to do more debt as well as, 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 uh, as uh, equity investments. Um, but uh, uh, we need to make sure or, or, or basically operators on the ground that are looking for anchor investors like ourselves need to make sure that uh, certain criteria are met, mainly, mainly on, on as I said earlier, on documentation um, to allow us to manage our, res our risk and, 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 and do what we would do in any other, let's say, uh, in, a, in any other scenario in terms of risk management. Um, so that's that's on that, uh, just to make sure that you know the willingness is there. Now, on the, on on the equity side, uh, we've done so far two two equity investments, and uh, the, the we as a bank are our intention is to do obviously a lot more. However, because of the certain uh, let's say the perceived uh, let's say stability of the local market and the lack of depth in terms of uh, of actual opportunities, there's a lot more capital available for investments in equity than actual opportunities. Usually what that does is it drives values up. You know, operators are, you know, and, and rightly so. If you have three, four people that are willing to, um, you know, compete for, for a nice, interesting asset, then fair game. But it's just, we won't be able to do that, i.e. It just means that we're not additional and there's no need for us. So we would allow other, 
other uh, other investors uh, to uh, to do that. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question. Thank you, Adil. And our equity event is actually at 2 p.m. tomorrow, downstairs in the networking area. Thank you all for being here with us, but thanks to my great speakers today. It was really a pleasure having you and hearing and learning from you. Thank you all, and see you all tomorrow. Thank you.